Okay, everybody, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the world, from the ITEFL YLT SIG Committee. I'm Joan Kang Shin, the Online Events Coordinator, and I'm delighted to welcome Vinny Nobre, who is our June webinar speaker. And so I see you all in the chat box introducing yourselves. Please make sure you let us know where you're logging in from if you're joining us just now. So allow me to introduce Vinny. Vinny is a managing partner at Troika, a startup that focuses on education projects. He has an MA from the University of Chichester with an emphasis on teacher education and YLs or young learners. He is also a Cambridge CELTA, ICELT, and Delta tutor, and a course book author for primary and secondary school schools Hello, everyone. Good morning. Can you see me? Thank you, Joan, so much. Thank you for the, the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity. It feels great to be here. Uh, and I see a lot of people from different places. Um, so as, as Joan said, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, well, I'm super excited to be talking a little bit about professional development focus on the young learners and the teenagers, preteens, teachers. Uh, uh, professional development and the education these are areas that are very dear to me and working with children and teenagers is also something that I enjoy very much so when I was invited to uh, do this webinar I thought this would be a perfect combination so uh, let's let's get started well um, I think that the first thing that we uh, that I want to to start with is by identifying one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, when it comes to professional development and uh, teaching young learners. Uh, I think that uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face is the fact that the world is changing really, really fast. Um, and it is my, my belief, and not only my belief, but it's also what uh, a, lot, a lot of people have 
saying and discussing is that education is not not necessarily following the changes of the world world uh, at the same speed. So, so we have other science like medicine, for example, or technology that are changing really, really fast. When it comes to education, we seem to be a, a bit slower than the changes around the world. And I think that this is the biggest challenge that we face. at the moment when it comes to professional development uh, and when it comes to dealing with the, the children and the teenagers who are in this ever-changing, fast-paced world. So the, the kids and the, the, the teens that we are teaching today are extremely different from the kids and the teens that uh, I started teaching 20 years ago, for example. Uh, and we need to catch up and try to understand a little bit better what their expectations are, what their needs are, so that we can um, adapt our practice and develop uh, continuously to cater for them. So, as we've been changing and trying to get things right in this, this uh, very dynamic world, uh, we have been looking at new pedagogies and methodologies. Um, Language learners, this is what Liber says, language learners tend to be less and less seen as mere objects of teaching. So this is one of the changes that in education we have already implemented. Increasingly, they become active partners in individualized and interactive learning processes. And then the language teachers tend to be less and less seen as authoritative truth tellers, the source of all knowledge, the ones who, who uh, know everything and who tell, tell students what they need to know. Uh, we have to become, and we should be moving towards becoming guides, advisors, facilitators of learning processes. Uh, of course, when we talk about primary and uh, secondary, this uh, changes a little bit. I will be talking about the development of the teacher uh, of young learners and uh, teenagers, uh, because a lot of things overlap. Whenever I, I have the opportunity to uh, identify what focuses a little bit more on the primary teacher or the secondary teacher, I will make that uh, clear to you. 
When it comes here to uh, becoming a guide, an advisor, a facilitator, we all know that when working with primary students, uh, we need to give them more guidance and more support. But I think that one of the biggest changes that we are facing at the moment and one of the biggest challenges that we face is how do we withdraw a little bit and how do we start preparing these kids so that they, they become more um, interactive, they become more active in their learning process. So that when we they get to secondary, they have even more autonomy and more independence. Um, one of The, the challenges that we face is for us to develop professionally is that in many Many, many contexts. We uh, uh, were educated. We, we had teachers who were truth tellers. So we had hundreds and of thousands of hours of exposure to teachers who told us what to do, what to believe in, what to read. Uh, who uh, saw themselves as source of knowledge and behaved this way. So in a lot of contexts, our repertoire, that what is familiar to us, is the, the, the authoritative truth teller as a teacher. But as it turns out, we need to shift this paradigm and we need to uh, look at this experience that we had as information for us to become a facilitator and not as a model that we want to reproduce. So I think that this is one of the biggest challenges. And it is a special challenge because as Donald Freeman says, teacher thinking as a central part of teaching is a relatively recent view. For many, many years, teacher thinking, the process of thinking of the teacher was not regarded as something that was central to the teaching. It was it focused, the, the development of teachers focused more, more on the behavior. behaviors and the activities. And as Donald Freeman said, that teaching is more, more than simply behavior or Activity. It is rooted in teachers' backgrounds, beliefs, knowledge.
So we still find a lot of development initiatives that revolve around the behavior and the activities. So what do you do here? What activities are fun? What activities are interesting? And, and uh, uh, it, it is a, a bit rare, it's a bit uh, challenging to find professional development. Professional development initiatives that will focus on the teacher's background. That will consider. Oh, that don't worry, Vinny. There's a that the teacher is in, and then the students as well. The, the belief behind the decisions that are made and uh, uh, more in-depth knowledge of our practice. And I think that this is really the way to go. When we talk, talk about professional development of uh, the teacher of young learners and teens, we want to focus on the background. the beliefs and the knowledge so that We can become guides, advisors, and facilitators. So for us to truly become uh, the, the facilitator that we want to be, 
um, we have to stop looking for the ready-made recipes, the fun activity, the 10 games that we can play with young learners. And we need to start discussing and creating a forum where we have the opportunity to delve into our backgrounds, our beliefs, and where we can deepen our knowledge about a range of things. And this is what I'm going to, to suggest now. So following Donald Freeman's uh, idea, uh, I would like to use the CASA framework. Um, don't know if you're familiar with the, this framework, but um, it's a framework that was suggested by Donald Freeman for professional development. Uh, essentially, uh, it revolves around four pillars for professional development and uh, um, full-fledged teacher, a qualified, competent teacher. should focus on developing these four pillars. CASA stands for knowledge, attitude, skills, and awareness. And I will now try to do uh, tell you a little bit what knowledge, what attitude, what skills, and what awareness the teacher of the young learners and the teenagers today uh, can be focusing on. Well, uh, uh, I think that, as I mentioned before, the real challenge really lies on the attitude. student the awareness. Uh, uh, and this is the most Objective part of what we do. Uh, uh, thinking about how, how uh, we behave, our attitudes according uh, in front of situations, and how aware we are of certain things. Uh, uh, so these, these are two areas that I really want us to 
focus on. I will be talking about all the four. Four of them. But there is a natural overlap, very, very natural overlap. Uh, in some aspects. So there are things that I will uh, put under the umbrella of attitudes, but that are related to knowledge, for example. And you, one, one can only develop Of, of certain things if, if they have the right attitude to be constantly learning and developing themselves or the awareness to know that this is a, an area that needs to be focused on. So, so the Kaza framework, the knowledge The attitudes, the skills, and the awareness, the we are all intertwined. I will try to break it into more specific Pieces so that we can uh, uh, just for the sake of discussion and for for. the presentation itself. So let's start a little bit with knowledge.
knowledge uh, is getting information and turning that into something that is relevant that is meaningful is not just accumulating data. It's not just reading hundreds of books, but it's really how you get all, all the this information of this data that you have access to. And today we have access to a lot of information. But how you process that and turn that information to effect to practice and something that is meaningful. So the first uh, aspect of knowledge that I think that the teacher of the young learners and the teenagers really should develop is a full and deep understanding of the main characteristics and the needs of each age group. Uh, and this, I believe, is quite challenging because the age groups can be very different from context to context. So uh, if I come here and I tell you what a 10-year-old student looks like, um, I, I might be overgeneralizing things and not taking into consideration your specific context. In some contexts, for example, the 10-year-old is much more mature because of the historical and social uh, constraints or um, situations or features of the, the community that he or she lives in. Uh, in other contexts, for example, and sometimes even in the same country, I'm not only talking about nationality, the characteristics and the needs of a 10-year-old will be very different. Uh, because of the kind of experiences that uh, have been provided to them. However, there are overall uh, uh, characteristics, there are overarching principles that uh, we need to bear in mind when we look at the, the children and the age group that we are working with. And having knowledge of what uh, uh, they are like, how they behave, uh, how their uh, brain is, is, is being Form their affective needs, their linguistic needs, is 
vital for the success. of the, the teacher who's working with the yeah, learner mages. And nowadays, knowledge uh, is expanding quite a lot because uh, we are. Faced with a lot of changes in the way that we do things, so there is a, a, a list of, of things that the teacher needs to know. It's not just the language anymore. But it's still the language. Um, so I'll mention some of these things. And I, I will start with the language because it is the core of what we do. And I personally truly believe that the English teacher needs to be constantly studying the English language. And when it comes to the teacher of the young learners, uh, oftentimes uh, it, it's believed that you don't really need to study the language because you are only teaching young learners. And I find this extremely yeah. irresponsible because I think that the teacher of young learners really needs to master the, the language and uh, they actually need to have skills, and I'll show you this, skills and competences that are quite complex. So um, for some weird reason, historically, in many places, the less experienced teacher works with uh, young learners or teenagers, but especially young learners in primary. Uh, and I really, really think that this is wrong. I think that if you're working with primary, if you're working with children, you need to have a good control of the language and you need to have so many other skills and so many other competences that sometimes the novice teacher is uh, still being developed and can't really cope with that. But knowledge of English language, knowledge of the teaching and the learning process, second or foreign language acquisition, depending on your, your context, this is vital to what we do. And this is, regardless of the age group, it, it, this is something that the English teacher has to be constantly focusing on. It is very, very important that we know about the English language and that we know how the languages are learned. Um, we uh, have also been facing, and this is uh, something that is a bit more recent, we have also been facing uh, the need to put students as protagonists in the whole process, uh, which goes back a little bit to what I mentioned previously, uh, that shifts the, 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 the role of the teacher from being the truth teller, the one who knows everything, to actually being a facilitator, actually uh, guiding students and uh, helping them feel that they own the entire process, that they are the main actors in their learning process. So this, uh, it's, it's knowledge about how it happens, but as I said, there is a natural overlap and we need to also have the skills that will allow us to place students as the center part of the, the learning process. Um, guys, I see that a lot of you are typing, but nothing is showing up to me. Uh, so I don't know if, if there is a problem with my thingy, but uh, or if you're just typing and not sending. So just so that you know. Um, okay, great, great. Uh, ah, okay, Joe, thank you. 
can we include knowledge and cognitive domain? What is more important in these four? Uh, yes, definitely, we can include knowledge in, in cognitive domain. Uh, and for me, the most important aspect uh, here, and I, um, I, I think I, I hinted at that, the, the most important pillar is really awareness. Because if you're not aware, if you, if you don't know what you don't know, or if you're not concerned about getting to know yourself better, you, you'll never identify the knowledge that you have to develop. You will never uh, focus on the skills. You, you, you will be in a comfort, comfort zone. Uh, so I think that our, um, awareness is the fuel that can actually propel everything. Uh, so I think uh, awareness is very, very important. Um, when it comes to specific knowledge as well and studying uh, what is happening, we, we've been uh, witnessing the maker movement uh, um, and, and how it's, it's coming to an integral part of the teaching and the learning process with both primary and uh, secondary. Uh, with secondary especially, uh, and getting students to actually produce things and um, create, design things, and use their hands to be more creative and to collaborate. So this is a, a, a new knowledge for the teacher. So how does this maker movement how does it take place? How does it impact my teaching? So this is something that uh, we should also be studying and looking into. Um, Project-based learning is also an approach that as teachers of young learners, we need to have the knowledge about. We need to know what project-based learning is, uh, how we go about it, how we can uh, set successful contexts where project-based learning is uh, the, 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 the backbone of what we are doing. And both with primary and secondary, and the kind of project, the kind of, of um, delivery and setup of that project will change. So we go back to the knowledge of the age group so that we, it's not just, oh, I know about project-based learning, cool, but how does this project-based learning relate to the context that you're teaching in? Uh, how, what kind of project, what kind of support do your students need if they are primary or if they are secondary? So um, it's not just the, the pure knowledge of the approach, the teaching approach, but how in the awareness of how this approach relates to the, the context that you're in. Um, gamification is also an area that uh, I highly recommend we as teachers study and learn more about. Um, when it comes to young learners and teenagers as well, um, we discuss a lot the importance of games and we talk a lot about games, uh, but I often see games being used as a, a marginal activity, something that is fun, uh, without delving into the why and wherefore, um, sometimes missing out the opportunity to further understand the rationale behind the choices of games. And gamification is much more than just the games. Um, there is more to it and it, it does generate a lot of engagement it, gen it makes learning more meaningful. Um, it helps learners collaborate if it's done appropriately instead of uh, using competitive games or competitions. With gamification, we can have the same elements of a game, for example, but fostering collaboration and mutual respect and all that. So these are some areas of knowledge that the young learners uh, teacher uh, or the teacher of teenagers should be focusing on at the moment. Um, but there's more, of course. <laughs> uh, there is technology, and uh, we can't ignore the fact that technology is present a lot in what we do. And uh, I see a lot of teachers resisting a little bit the idea of technology, but quite frankly, fighting against it is not really going to take us anywhere because technology, I think, uh, is here to stay. So we need to understand uh, how technology can enhance learning instead of uh, being hostages uh, of technology. So things like bring your own device, for example, generating uh, a discussion on what age uh, would be would it be okay for students to bring their own device? So what are the policies? What what is your culture like? The place where you work? What are the the beliefs in that particular place? So when can students bring their own device, or can they ever? bring their own device to school or to class, for example, uh, for you to use technology with them. But this is the decision that needs to be made with very, uh, with a lot of consideration, with very careful thinking. 
uh, with real knowledge of the features of that particular age group, the benefits that technology can, can bring, uh, and not just a decision that you make like, oh yeah, 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 let's bring technology into the classroom because everybody's talking about it. Um, same thing with the flipped classroom. When can we flip the classroom and how can we flip the classroom? Uh, knowing about it will allow us to make uh, conscious decisions. Again, I feel that sometimes we're very reactive to what is happening around us. So people are flipping the classroom and talking about it. So we feel that we have to do the same. But we can only do it effectively if we understand what flipping the classroom really means and why it's done. So instead of doing it just because you feel that there is a pressure around you to flip the classroom suddenly, uh, let's first understand the, the reasons behind it, well, what the benefits are, so that we can flip the classroom when it's appropriate in the context that allows this to happen. And we can monitor the results as well to see if it's really working or if it's just a fad, for example. We need to... Oh, flipping the classroom. Oh, hi, Anna. Um, to flip the classroom is when you uh, students do part of the lesson, when they, they get the content before the class. So they watch a video, they read something, and they come to class prepared for the subject matter. And then they have more opportunities in class to communicate, to ask questions, to develop speaking, for example, because the formal presentation is done prior to the lesson. It is uh, something that is done quite frequently in university courses. And this is, I, here it goes, this is one of my uh, reservations, let's say, when it comes to flipping the classroom, because I think that sometimes we get a model that works really well in one context, and we try to incorporate this model without analyzing the pros, the cons. Uh, and I think that flipping the classroom in higher education makes a lot of sense. Uh, you get students to read everything beforehand, to watch all the videos they can, and then when they come to class, they should bring the knowledge for a discussion. In the English language classroom, when working with young learners and teenagers, we can definitely benefit from flipping the classroom, but I think that we need to adapt a little bit and be very careful when deciding how the classroom is going to be flipped. Um, blended learning is also out there, and we can use blended learning principles, and we can blend the learning when we're working with primary and secondary. Uh, but how this is going to be done uh, demands a, a very good knowledge of what blended learning truly is and what the students are like to see if it's truly going to be effective or if we're just using technology, again, for the sake of technology. Um, gamification uh, is quite similar to game-based learning. There, there, uh, there are more complexities in, in gamification because you're really getting all the principles. I'm answering a question, guys, sorry, that uh, popped up. That um, you get all the principles of games. So it's not just basing the learning on, on games, uh, but it's quite similar for, for, for the sake of um, uh, illustration. Let's say that, yes, very, very similar. Uh, and also uh, going back to the, the technology bit, uh, we also need to have knowledge about learning management systems because these guys, have arrived and they will be here for us uh, and they can help us tremendously, but they can also become just uh, a white elephant in the room. So we need to understand how the learning management systems can really enhance learning uh, and assess whether uh, they can be used to, to enhance the quality of the student's experience and not just be something that we have to use because it's there. The, something that might generate more work or more complexity and so on and so forth. It's also important that the young learners, uh, teachers, be aware, uh, become more and more aware of neuroscience, the cognitive development of the children, and again, what age uh, group uh, is like, what each age group re represents and how it works. Um, Plurilingual competence, and I'll talk about this in a second. Multiliteracies, knowledge about uh, what is going on in the world and how that child is being formed as an individual, as a citizen, so that we can uh, help them not only learn the language, but we can truly help them become more empowered, become more independent, more autonomous as, as learners. Um, we need to talk 
We need to know a little bit more about trans languaging, and I'll talk about this in a second. We need to know how uh, this uh, uh, event, this phenomenon is taking place and change maybe a little bit the way we believe in certain things. Uh, global competences are there. Uh, the, the English teacher will no longer teach only English. We need to help our students develop competences. And the global competences that, that can be developed will also vary according to the age group. So what global competences make more sense for us to focus on in primary, in secondary, but when we choose a course book, a piece of material, when we adapt a piece of material, when we write our, our lesson plan, we need to, to bear in mind that we are not just teaching language for the sake of language, but we are also helping our students develop competences that will make them a global citizen. So it's quite a heavy burden, quite a lot on our shoulders, right? Uh, and together with the global competences, the sustainable development goals that uh, United Nations uh, set in 2015. Uh, if you don't know much about it, I, I highly recommend you look it up and uh, learn a little bit more about it because uh, these goals are goals for education worldwide. And if everyone has the same goals, we can really change the world. We can really help the world become a better place. So let's just lift some of the, these knowledge areas that I mentioned, and I'd like to just expand a little bit on them. So when it comes to technology, for example, just providing students with access to classroom technology is no longer enough. For many years, you, if you had a computer in class, that was great, that was fun. Or if you had a lab that students could go to, great. Nowadays, schools are expected to make sure that teachers and students are using devices, software, apps, and other digital tools in active ways. What does it mean to use it in active ways? It means that we are no longer, uh, we don't expect the technology to be sitting there just to tell us the truth, pretty much uh, as the teacher used to do. So the technology is not there just for you to search something, to look it up, but to help students and teachers become more active and not more passive in the process. It does raise some issues, and I would like to bring these up a little bit. So when it comes to primary, for example, um, the access to technology will also vary a lot according to context. So in, in some places, parents' beliefs play a major role. So parents uh, don't think that kids should have access to technology, for example. There are issues related to child protection. So how do you monitor what students have access to? So there are a lot of different things that have to be taken into consideration. When you devise a plan, a policy on how technology can be used and integrated with the learning process, it shouldn't be done irresponsibly, like, oh, this is a great app, let's use it. No, let's analyze the purpose, how it enhances learning. If there are other issues uh, related to the age group in particular that have to be taken into consideration. Uh, when it comes to uh, secondary, it, it can definitely optimize meaningful engagement. Uh, students. Uh, can become much more interested in the lessons if they feel that technology is integrated in a fun, relevant way. However, it does raise also the issue of what kind of material they will be accessing and what kind of information they will be using because technology can often be a window to the world and sometimes we need to think about how we are going to exploit this in class. Are we going to limit and censor some things? Are we going to give students access to everything and develop critical thinking in them so that they know what they can use and what they cannot use? There are lots of questions there and the answers will vary from context to context. I really don't think that there is uh, a recipe there. Um, still talking about the knowledge that the young learners teacher needs to have. When it comes to making students feel as protagonists and uh, empowering them, in the, what Benjamin says is that in the modern era, the plan says schools must ensure that all students understand how to use technology as a tool to engage in creative, productive, lifelong learning rather than simply consuming passive content. So technology can help students become more active and become protagonists. So there is a good combination on how technology can empower students so that they can be more creative, more productive, and 
be less passive in the process of, oh, let me see, look for something in the, on the internet. Oh, I found this, I believe this, that's it. So we can really help students, uh, and I'm using the internet as an example, but technology is much more than just the internet, of course. But uh, we want students to feel empowered and critical in the whole process of um, using technology to uh, become more protagonists in their learning process. Um, the maker movement, which is knowledge that the teacher needs to have, uh, is, is really out there at the moment in many, many contexts. And the good news is that fortunately for educators, as Martini says, the maker movement overlaps with the natural inclinations of children and the power of learning by doing. New tools and technology again, such as 3D printing, robotics, microprocessors, wearable computing, e-textiles, smart materials, and new programming languages are being invented at an unprecedented pace. I love this word, very hard to say, I'll keep it um, Unprecedented pace. Um, the maker movement creates affordable, sometimes even free versions of these inventions and shares the tools and ideas online, creating a vibrant collaborative community of global problem solvers. So we see here again how things overlap. So we need to know about global citizenship, global competences. We need to know about technology. Uh, technology together is integrated with the maker movement. The maker movement uh, can use technology to help students become global problem solvers. So there are a lot of things that are in sync. And if we as teachers of young learners are just um, limited to our old ways, if we are not constantly developing and getting more and more knowledge, we will be limiting a lot of our practice and we will be preventing our students from having access to all of these things. And uh, this is our role as educators, is really to be constantly learning so that we can use this knowledge to enhance uh, our students' experience. When it comes to plurilingual competence, multiliteracy, strength languaging, as I mentioned before, we know that in global communities where English is a common language of communication alongside other languages, knowledge of other languages is an asset. Rather than diminish the learner's first language, and I love this quote, also known as subtractive bilingualism, Teachers should be encouraging uh, learners, and here it's my adaptation. I say teachers should be. I Absolutely, don't really think thank you are. so much, Vinny. Actually, it was such a wonderful presentation and thought provoking. And uh, judging from the comments and the questions, I think everybody in felt contrast, the same way that I did. And now I realize what some new webinar class. topics should be because you could see there was a lot of interest uh, generated a lot of in a few of the topics that you brought up, right? <laughs> The majority of the classroom where teachers yes. still believe that using l1 using students first language uh, yeah absolutely thank you for that to, i think that's a sign uh, of a really this, excellent uh, uh, language, presentation uh, is that is thought provoking so, uh, and also an generates and ideas for new discussion so thank you so uh, much for a great uh, webinar to, to, full of uh, useful ideas at, for uh, TEYL professional languages, development. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more and, from uh, Vinny, uh, he'll be giving the opening plenary a, a at the more, 16th um, International Ras TESOL Conference. So and the dates are the 19th to the 22nd of July, of July in Caxias do Sol. Did I pronounce that correctly? Caxias do Sol, Brazil. And IATEFL SIG is collaborating if with the Bras TESA YLT SIG during the conference to provide a mini professional language. development so course on teaching uh, pre primary and in, primary. In, in this, and just give me uh, one fields. moment um, uh, so that I can bring up the information. Oops, I have, I think, clicked on the wrong one. Give me one second. There we go. And so um, the ITEFL Wild TSIG will be represented by Sandy Morale, kindly sponsored by Niall, and YLT SIG PR coordinator Bruno Andrade. And if you would like to register, please visit this link. I'm going to put it in the chat box now so you can just link to it very easily. 
there you go. And I hope you enjoyed today's YLT SIG webinar as much as we did. Between July to December, we will be collaborating with members of the C Group to bring you six creative monthly webinars. And these webinars will focus on working creatively with a range of young learner ages. So please see our SIG social media channels for forthcoming webinar updates. And with that, I just want to thank Vinny one more time for a wonderful webinar. And thank you all for coming. Bruno, would you like to add any last thoughts about uh, yeah, the yeah, webinar? Just, mm -hmm. just that I'm looking forward to seeing many of the faces here uh, for the mini course that we are providing at the Brasis International Conference in a few days, actually, right? It's just around the corner. And I'll see Vini there. So thank you very much for being here, guys. See you in Caxias do Sul. Thank you all. Bye-bye.